Michael Ford is a supply chain expert with TQM Works Consulting. He provides innovative solutions based on 30 years of experience in retail, distribution, manufacturing, and consulting. He has presented at over 350 industry events throughout the US, Canada, Japan, Nigeria, South Africa, and Australia. He is a charismatic speaker who specializes in delivering training that is edutaining and combines his technical expertise with personal skills to develop a unique outside-the-box approach to life's challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Michael Ford. Thank you so much uh, on behalf of uh, SAPEX and uh, certainly uh, the crew we've got. I want to thank them for the technical support there. Thank you, Ken, for uh, being the room moderator for this session. And thank you all for showing up. Could you do me a favor, please, at this point in time? Could everyone please stand up or stay auf bitte? That's your German lesson for the day, stay auf bitte. Okay, thank you, you may sit down. Uh, people coming in, if you could come up front, there are handouts at the seats up front, you'll need them for the session. Uh, that little exercise was to help you become master negotiators with your suppliers. What's the number one way to get something? Ask, just ask. Number one way, just ask. Uh, I can't speak for the statistics in South Africa, but I know in America, overwhelmingly, the people who get raises are people who ask their boss for raises. So you got nothing to lose by asking. Uh, for this session, I want to make three promises uh, that's going to happen within the next 48 minutes. Number one, you're going to do work. Number two, you're going to have fun. Number three, I'm going to turn you all into agents of change. And I think all three of those are the necessary ingredients for training. In order for us to learn, we have to be engaged and involved, i.e. do work. You've got to enjoy yourself. Uh, if you're not having fun, if you're not going to remember the stuff. And the change agent is important because if you learn something, you actually have to implement it at work. If you just learn something and you can read stuff that's in an encyclopedia or from a website, but you don't change your behavior at work, what was the point? It's knowledge, but you're not putting it to you. So, promise, you're going to do work, have fun, I'm going to turn you into agents of change. This is the agenda, five major topical areas that we will accomplish uh, by the end of this session. I should note, you have this handout, uh, you don't necessarily need to take a lot of notes. A uh, copy of my business card will be available at the end. If you drop off yours, I'll give you a PDF of the slideshow. And Sopix is going to put the answer key to these exercises on the WOVA app. So when I explain the answers, you don't necessarily have to try and track them all down. You'll be able to get that answer key from the WOVA app. All right, so uh, just moving ahead to the first one, the purchasing continuum. And I should mention, uh, in terms of you doing your work, uh, this isn't welfare, I'll pay you. I'm a capitalist, so there will be candy handed out or prizes if you give a really good answer. Um, unless you specify when I'm coming towards you, it might be random candy, but I think I've got cinnamon and butterscotch. If you have a preference, make sure you tell me that when I get over to you. Also, if you volunteer to answer a question, or if you have any questions, my good friend Karen has a microphone, so we'll make sure to capture that. So if you could wait till she gets over to you. So raise your hand, make sure uh, she sees you. All right, so uh, first opportunity for a piece of candy in case anyone coming in here already knows the answer, and that's very possible. Anytime I do anything in front of an audience, whether it's a dinner meeting, a conference session, a workshop, a college class, I always know the number one rule is there is always much more talent and knowledge seated in a room than standing in a room. So we'll look for this opportunity right now. Is anyone familiar with the purchasing continuum? No, Ford, that's why we're here, all right? So uh, uh, the purchasing continuum is indicated on the first page of your handout. You've got these arrows extending to the left and to the right. And it describes a series of progressions here in terms of the buy. So over to the far left, 
This is tactical order placement. All right, you just place an order. It could be a one-time spot buy. Uh, so I think of the example, you know, over the past 10 years or so, I probably put 30 to 35,000 miles a year on my vehicle. Uh, it's not a long-term relationship with a gas station. It's wherever I need gas, I pull over, I get gas. I might never buy gas there ever again in my life. It's a one-time spot buy. I need the item, it's available, I just grab it. As we progress from the left side of tactical order placement and move across towards the right, you're going to find that we start to develop short-term, medium-term, or long-term relationships with our suppliers. So the tactical is, it's really just focusing on the order placement, all right? We contrast that with strategic over to the far right. This isn't about placing orders. It's about forming relationships based on mutual compatibility, interests, and trusts. And we could say that when we look at this, you could say, well, it's a one-time spot buy, or it's placing a purchase order, or maybe it's a blanket purchase order. You say, okay, ship me 100 a week over the next 10 weeks. Maybe it's an annual blanket purchase order or even multi-year contracts. And to the far right extreme, ultimately, the strategic partnership could end up as a merger or an acquisition. Are there any questions on how I've described this? Sometimes I use the analogy to talk about personal relationships. So over to the uh, far left, that could be having coffee with my good friend Karen. <laughs> and then moving across to the right, you could say, well, maybe that's a lunch or a dinner date in a movie. Could be dating someone, ultimately a monogamous relationship. And then to the far right, we could say that's marriage. I don't want to get too deep into that. I'll leave you to decide for yourself whether a marriage is a merger or an acquisition, all right? I don't want to start any hostile arguments this early in the morning, but that's what I'm talking about here in terms of the relationship with our suppliers, whether it's something that is just focused on a single-time or multi-time buys versus longer-term relationships that are focused on the strategy. It's very important for us to remember not all items, not all commodities, not everything is going to require that you have a strategic relationship with your suppliers. Some things just aren't as important as others. We'll get more into that when I talk about the four major type of buys on the next slide. But let me ask, uh, for what I've covered this far, would anybody like to volunteer because the candy's waiting down my pants and I don't know how strong my belt is. So would somebody like to volunteer for your organization, where you work now or where you've worked in the past, just suggest some item and where do you think it is there? Do you think, you know, can you name an item and describe your industry so it makes sense to the rest of the audience? Karen, be ready with a microphone. Anybody want to volunteer? And you can give an example, a tactical, strategic, or somewhere in the middle. I promised you do work. I guess that depended on you to be part of that. All right. Okay, I worked for a, a, a company that manufactured marine cranes and winches, and we had a, a strategic relationship with our supplier of steel. That's a made, huge component, overwhelming majority of the end product. All right. Excellent example. Thank you very much, Colin. Do you have a preference for butterscotch or cinnamon? I can give it to you. You can use that. That is a valuable commodity. You can trade that. It's like cigarettes in prison, all right? So trade off with others later on. Not that I know about that from personal experience. You can learn everything on Google. All right. All right, let's go ahead to the next one. You've got a graph on the bottom part of that first page that shows a two-by-two two matrix along the X or horizontal axis. This is what we have uh, known as the contribution to profit or the percentage of cost of goods sold, all right? So near the origin, you're saying it's really cheap stuff or it's not used in a lot of things. Going out towards the right on that horizontal axis, you're saying it's used in lots of items, like as Colin mentioned, the steel and the overhead cranes. It's something that's pretty expensive. It's a big portion of uh, our overall bill of material items. Along the vertical or Y axis, is the supply chain risk. So down near the point of origin, it means 
man, there's dozens of companies in Cape Town. I can order this and it'll show up tomorrow morning. I don't even need to order it FedEx overnight. It's going to be there because they're right up the road. At the higher point of supply chain risk, you say, well, that's rough. There's not a lot of suppliers. In fact, sometimes maybe it's that very evil position known as sole source, opportunity for a piece of candy. Could somebody please uh, help me to appreciate a distinction between single source and sole source? I wasn't sure. You went like that, and I wasn't <laughs> sure. I wasn't sure if that was psych. So please, Joanna. Um, uh, just to start, I'm working in government. Working in government, okay. Yes, and infrastructure. So in our environment, the single source is when you make use of one supplier. A sole supplier is a person that's the only provider or supplier in the country for a particular item. Thank you very much. Would you appreciate cinnamon or butterscotch? Uh, cinnamon. <laughs> so a single source, we made that decision. This is the only supplier we're gonna buy from. Sole source, it wasn't our decision. That's the marketplace. There's only one company that makes this item on the planet. So looking at the combination between high to low supply chain risk and high to low contribution to profit or portion of cost of goods sold, we have four different quadrants. And there are terms for each of these different type of buy items. Before I start revealing them, again, let's see if we have the experts in the audience. Does anyone know what they are? And I'll start with the lower left quadrant. So items that are not a high supply chain risk. There's lots of availability and they're not really a major portion of the cost of goods sold. Non-critical, we say they're non-critical. They're not that important with respect to either of the two uh, factors that we're looking at here. As we move across to the right, okay, so we're looking at things that are still low risk, but they are a major portion of the cost of goods sold. Does anyone know what those type of items are called? Pardon? Leverage items. Leverage items. Leverage I Oh, cinnamon or butterscotch? Cinnamon. I'm waiting for somebody to say chocolate and say, sign up for the workshop tomorrow. All right, you got to work for three hours to get chocolate. All right, it's Hershey's chocolate. There will be some good stuff there. We call this leverage items because you can leverage suppliers against each other. All right, it makes sense. It's to your advantage to get them to compete for your business. In this quadrant, it's the buyers who have the power over the sellers. So it's just, you know, fair consequence of the free market for you to take advantage of that position. Leverage them against each other. Say you compete and whoever gives me the best deal, I'm going to make a lot of money because it's a big portion of my cost of goods sold. Let's go diagonal to the upper left. So now we are talking about items that are a small portion of the cost of goods sold or small contribution to profit. But there's not a lot of sources of supply out there. The advantage is to the sellers of the, these items versus the buyers. What is the name for the items in this quadrant? Sir? Uh, they are called bottlenecks. Bottlenecks. And we know the term bottleneck. Well, we know it from theory of constraints. We say, all right, it's the constraint or whatever. But of course, the original term, I think maybe I like to think of the original Coke classic bottle that was like an hourglass shape. It's actually any bottle. You know, if you tip it over, doesn't matter how wide the body of the bottle is, the liquid is not going to flow out any faster than the bottleneck, right? That's usually the narrowest point. So we say it's a constraint. It's a bottleneck. This is a problem for us. It's not really an expensive component, but there's not a lot of places out there where I can buy it. Sounds like a problem. We have one quadrant left. The upper right, which indicates major portion in terms of contribution to cost of goods sold and also a high supply chain risk. Does anyone know what the term is for the items in that quadrant? And it's not critical. <laughs> Strategic. You're going to be able to open a candy store by the time we're done here. 
Yeah, these are the strategic items. You might see how there's a little bit of similarity here or consistency between that purchasing continuum and the four quadrants or four type of buys that we have uh, indicated here. If you're a purchasing agent, like I was, back when I used to have a regular job <laughs> and a regular paycheck before I started doing this stuff, if you're a purchasing agent and you had your choice, which quadrant? Where would you like to say, I, I, man, I want to buy these items? Leverage. Leverage. Yeah, absolutely, right? Man, that's easy as heck. Holy smoke. It's easy to look like a superstar there. Where would you absolutely not want to be? What was that? You, uh, I'm going to give you a piece of candy because I reward participation, <laughs> but I will say less than optimal. Did you say? We, got, we only got a couple left out of the choices. One's already been used. The one you want to be is the leverage. I'm saying, which one do you absolutely not want to be? It's not strategic. That's not the best answer. Who said that first? Did you say that first? Think so. All right. Somebody in the back. We'll make sure. Listen, if I don't catch you, you know, at the end, when you come up and grab my card, drop off your card, grab some candy if there's any left. Yeah, man, wouldn't that be heck? I mean, you know, I guess, you know, if you really truly were a purchasing superstar, you'd say, yeah, I want that challenge. I want to be buying the bottleneck items. That's kind of tough. Let me ask this question, um, and if you have a writing instrument, it might be helpful to draw a diagonal, like a big X over this two-by-two two matrix so that you have a line that goes from the point of origin to the upper right, you don't need a compass or protractor to make it a perfect 45 degree angle. But from the point of origin, go across the non-critical items up to the strategic. Then draw another diagonal from the upper left, you know, bisecting the bottleneck and leverage quadrants. So you've got two lines here, a big X. One of those lines represents the two type of buys that you prefer to have multiple sources, the other diagonal will be a line that represents the two quadrants where your preference would be to have multiple sources. So there's multiple sources versus single source, which is which. You have a 50-50 chance of getting this right. So you should at least guess. Anyone who hasn't jumped in the pool yet, here's your opportunity. Did I tell you guys I used to work in a bowling alley? Is that strike is being funny? Mike's not working. Sir. Yes. The one going uh, left to right is single source. So you're saying non critical and strategic, less than optimal. Wait, did you say single or multiple? Single. Oh, no, you're right. I'm sorry. I'm still, I'm still hung up on. Uh, trying to read things backwards there. It's single source because of the reasons that uh, my strategic partnership, we're not practicing polygamy here. All right, you're married to one person. For the non-critical items, one source. In fact, the lower left quadrant, that's VMI, vendor managed inventory. That's where you tell somebody, I don't want my planners and buyers wasting any time on this stuff. It's not worth it. I can buy it from dozens of suppliers and spending time on it doesn't help my contribution to profit. So non-critical and strategic items would be the ones that you tend to say, I only need one supplier. There are always exceptions, maybe it's two or three. But it's definitely leverage and bottleneck that you want multiple suppliers. If you single source the leverage items, how are you able to leverage suppliers against each other? Right? Does that make sense? And the bottlenecks, you want multiple suppliers because, gosh darn, I don't ever want to run out. I don't ever want to shut down my production line because of a cheap part. I want you to think about those four quadrants and, and think, can you identify, you know, uh, for, for your items that you buy, can you think of examples of items? Strategic, non-critical, leverage your bottleneck. I got 31 minutes. I need your help filling those. 
Okay, so for VMI, at a company I worked at, it was the hardware. Nuts, bolts, O-rings, E-rings, simple stuff. We told a hardware uh, vendor, stop by twice a month. You come in here, we got min-max. Make sure we never, ever run out. I don't want my people worrying about that. MRO items also work out pretty good for the lower left quadrant. What is MRO? And uh, please do more than explain the acronym. So tell me more than what the initials MRO. Tell me what the initials stand for, but then please also describe what that means. Nobody told us we were going to do work. <laughs> A young man here. Uh, material requirement. Material. Uh, requirements and operation equipments and those are the small bolts and nuts that you'll have in a, in a warehouse or something for the bolts and nuts for what product for what the butts nuts and bolts go on what on what items are you suggesting they go on i just want to make sure i understand what you're saying here i reward you for participating if we are making toy red wagons, and you're talking about the nuts and bolts on that, that would not be MRO. MRO is maintenance, repair, and operating supply. Nuts and bolts that go on to my CNC equipment, my drill press or whatever, the spares, parts for those, that would be MRO. MRO, maintenance, repair, and operating supply. Those are stocks or items we buy and send to the floor, but they do not go into the end product that is shipped out to the customer. So uh, grease, oil, lubricants for our machines on the floor, shop floor rags, any stocks we buy, they go to the floor, but they don't go into the end item. So again, VMI, hardware, or maybe some things that we use repeatedly in our uh, end items, they go into our product, but it's floor stock. We don't use MRP or whatever, it's just continuous replenishment or something like that. For the... Uh, Leverage item, you know, when I worked at an electronic contract manufacturer, things like uh, sheet metal, we call them box assemblies, all right? Somebody fabricates sheet metal, box drills, holes, or whatever. So there's lots of places, you know, lots of sheet uh, metal fabrication shops. Cable harness assemblies, you know, lots of places I could get those as well. And they were a major component in electronic contract manufacturing. In the upper right, uh, complex printed circuit board assemblies. Most expensive uh, printed circuit board assembly, we called it the brains of the product, was 50,000 American dollars. So that was something that was kind of tough. Very tight tolerances. Uh, you know, tolerances on the uh, blueprints for this item were like to 10 thousandths of an inch. So that was the upper right-hand corner. And the uh, upper left... The bottleneck items, something like uh, coated hardware. I used to buy hardware and I thought, oh, this is easy. Buying nuts and bolts, E-rings, O-rings, no challenge here, till I found out there was such thing as specialty or coated hardware. It still it changes the cost from 10 cents a screw to 15 cents, but it's really tough because you got to send it across the country or someplace. Uh, so it was really tough. And you said, man, I don't ever want a multi-thousand dollar complex electronic uh, assembly system here to be held up because I couldn't buy nuts and bolts just because it was specialty hardware that there were only a couple places I could find it. Are there any questions on the four types of buys? WFA is the acronym for Weighted Factor Analysis which goes by a couple different names. It's also known as the alternate Attribute ranking, and it's also known as a QFA, qualitative factor analysis. Any volunteers who have heard of this, either of these terms, any of these terms, and wish to describe what it is? All right, this is an analysis where we're going to convert something that could be qualitative or judgmental, a qualified opinion, into metrics so we can do a calculation and come up with a selection for our vendors. Um, we, we need to think about our choice here. What are the factors or criteria that are important? And you've got an example 
there. So this is on the uh, next uh, page if you haven't turned over yet. I am not saying this is the template you always have to use. This was an example I created. I picked these factors. I said this is what I think is important. You might pick something different. You might say, well, maybe price, maybe location is important. Maybe being ISO 9000 certified is important. You decide what those criterion are. Along the uh, left, the first column there, I got supplier A, B, and C, all right? So you come up with this list, you say, who, who's gonna be in the game? Who's submitting bids? Who am I uh, taking under consideration for who's uh, gonna become supplier with my organization? Not only do you have to pick who's gonna be the suppliers on the list, you gotta pick the factors, you assign a weight. So under each factor or criteria, you see a percentage there, that's a weight. Not all things are equally important. Maybe it's lead time, maybe it's cost, maybe it's location, maybe it's quality, maybe it's technical competence. Not all things are equally important. You need to make sure the sum of those weights, the percentages total 100%, or if you express them as decimals, they must sum up to 1.00. After you've got your possible suppliers, you've got the criterion across the top, you've got the weights, now you assign a score. So you say supplier A, how would I rate their performance on a scale of one to 10 for things like quality or customer service, et cetera? And again, that's judgmental, all right? Ford is saying this is what the score they get on a scale of one to 10. Now the maximum theoretical score, the way I've created this example, is gonna be a 10.0, right? If they scored a 10 on everything, and I assigned weights such that they total 100%, if you do the math, the highest score you could get is a 10.0. I've done the calculation for the first one. I trust it is somewhat obvious how I got that score. It's explained on the sheet there. You take the percentage, expressed as a decimal, multiply it by the score in that column, plus the percentage times the next score, plus the percentage times the next score, et cetera. Please complete the calculations for supplier B and supplier C, and we'll go beyond candy. That doesn't seem to be motivating you to the degree I thought appropriate, we'll say there will be a prize for the first person to get the calculations for B and C and tell me who the winner is. I will give you an opportunity to share that. Obviously at work, you could have an Excel spreadsheet to do this pretty quickly for you. But it's always good to remind ourselves the necessity to be able to do math. I'm worried we've got kids graduating from high school that can do calculus in their sleep but can't balance a monthly family budget. Another thing, uh, math wakes up the brain. For, so for those of you who ever decide to pursue any APICS or IBF or other certification, do some math problems on a piece of scrap paper before the exam. It wakes up the brain. It's like stretching your leg muscles before running a marathon. See what you can get out of Google? Make yourself sound like an expert. Get numbers here yet? You get. What have you got for supplier B? Seven, seven, comma eight nine. I need to convert that to American. Seven point eight nine. Uh, I have something different. What did you have for supplier C? Five point seven four. You are correct for C. Five point seven four B. I might want to check the math. Anyone else got something for B yet? 6.39 is correct. So which one is the winner? A is the winner. I don't trust you. We're not at the point, we're not at that right end spectrum, you know. 
you don't need to worry about copying down what I'm going to say now because, again, there will be a copy of the answer key available on WOVA. So uh, the totals to the far right it was 6.98 for A, 6.39 for B, and 5.74 for supplier C. There is a question. What other considerations may re exist with regard to using this tool? And I mean, other than you might say, hey, I think location or price or some other things. I don't mean that. I mean, in general, with the use of a weighted factor analysis. Colin. Yeah, you have to express tolerances. I mean, if you just look at supplier A, it might not, they might have won overall, but that four for schedule flexibility, for example, might be intolerable, okay? So you need, to, you need to also say any supplier that gets less than, I don't know, six or whatever, and it, or it might vary from quality to quality because the problem with an, av an average doesn't tell you the story. You know, if you have one foot in boiling water <laughs> and the other foot on ice, you'd be extremely uncomfortable, but the average temperature might be fine. Mm -hmm. So, so we could improve this tool if we said, look, you got to at least get a six or a seven on everything or above, because is it really an advantage to say, what if, what if we said price is really important in our environment and that was 50% of the weight and somebody's selling a widget, a bunch of people selling widgets for two bucks, one supplier's selling it for a buck. They're going to win this, even though they might have really poor customer service on time delivery, et cetera. Thank you very much, Colin. Some uh, other things that we might need to consider is how do I manage this bias here? You know, because we said, oh, all right, Ford picked what the factors were important. Ford picked the weights and Ford assigned the scored. Well, how about our entire purchasing or sourcing team reaches consensus on what's important? So that, that's something that could address the uh, bias inherent in the selection of factors, the assignment of weights, and the assignment of scores. Another thing that uh, might uh, be practical with the use of this tool is maybe you've got a list of dozens of potential suppliers. You use this list to pare it down from 24 suppliers, and then maybe the top three or five, you say, these are the ones I'm going to buy. I'm going to place orders with these top maybe three to five. The way I decide out of those, personal interviews, surveys, site audits, et cetera. All right, so then you break the tie uh, using other means. Any other questions or comments on the weighted factor analysis? Oh, there's a gentleman in the next to last row. I think it's quite difficult to pull out um, the subjective part of it entirely because when you say, for instance, customer service, everyone's got a slightly different view of customer service. So putting a weight on a, a number to it can be pretty tricky. Do you prefer uh, cinnamon or butterscotch? <laughs> I don't mind. Thank you. Yeah, so I, we'd have to clearly understand what these things mean. What's on time delivery? Does it mean it's got to be that day? Walmart says your truck, if it says your truck will show up at 9.55 a.m., it better show up at 9.55 a.m. They've got them in queue down to the exact hour and minute. Maybe some companies, okay, I confess, back in the 90s, I was working at a company. We said on-time delivery, it shows up that week. <laughs> it was scheduled to show up Monday. Anything Monday through Friday, we said, that's perfect. So thank you very much. We got to understand what these terms mean and define them as appropriate for our firm. One last tip, very important. You should do this analysis for each of the four quadrants. Does that make sense? Your leverage, bottleneck, non-critical, and strategic items, it's going to be different items that are important in different weights. All right, let's, uh, as Bob Seeger sang, turn the page to core competencies. I'm really hoping... Uh, somebody will be able to share their definition of what it means when we talk about core competencies. I have overstock of candy. Do not take my advice on inventory management then. Nobody knows what core competency is. I refuse to believe that, young man. So you do what you're good at. 
So if it's manufacturing, you focus on manufacturing, you outsource the rest. Your selling proposition, I would suppose, the so, product. Cinnamon or uh, butterscotch? Butterscotch. Finally. That was about to be outdated inventory. Yeah, it's what we are good at, all right? What we compete on. You exploit your core competency. It's what separates you from the pack, all right? And we have these four terms. There is such thing as an order winner, an order qualifier, a order non-issue, and an order loser. If you've uh, pursued the uh, APIC CPIM certification, you should be familiar with these terms. Volunteer to uh, provide the definitions, hopefully for all four, or at least one or two or any. I'll take cinnamon to match my shirt. Uh, I'm going to start with the order qualifiers, because that's what you got to do first, the order qualifiers. Those are the things that, at a bare minimum, you need to have to play in the game to be able to submit bids. Right? Those are the things you might potentially compete on that you have to have just to be considered. Now, I've created a graphic that suggests nine different potential core competencies. Again, this is a sample template. There's lots of other things you might compete on. You might decide for your firm not to use any of the nine on this list. I tried to pick nine that are you know, the most popular, according to my understanding, over the years, but you decide what it is that's going to be important. The order qualifiers are maybe the three or four items, just several items that you say you have to have in place and be good at just to be considered as a potential supplier. The order winner is that competitive characteristic that gets the customer to sign on the bottom line. So if the customer is thinking about three or four different potential companies to do business with, they've all got the order qualifiers in place, who gets the order? The one that is absolutely the best on the order winner. So you could say maybe the qualifiers are customer service, quality, and price. And then the order winner is the shortest lead time. Whoever can get me the item the quickest. Non-issues are those things that they're relatively unimportant. For uh, six years, I've been doing an online Lean Six Sigma Black Belt course with Binghamton University in upstate New York. And I always ask a question on this stuff. And I ask students to give a sample industry, whether it's healthcare, manufacturing, energy industry, whatever and tell me all of these things. And they all want to label everything as either an order winner or an order qualifier. It's really tough for us to say something isn't that important. But there are some things for your environment it's not worth wasting time on. It's not going to help generate more business. I uh, feel bold enough to disagree with a definition in the official Apex Dictionary for order loser. The Apex Dictionary pretty much defines an order loser as exactly the same thing as an order winner. So if the order winner was low price, the Apex Dictionary would be suggesting, well, high price is the order loser. I'm not saying that. Order loser is something that as you get better at, you lose business. There is a company in Japan that made customized motorcycles. They were trying to compete with Harley Davidson. So Americans would place order for this bike. Japanese company puts it together in three days and stores it in a warehouse for three weeks, lets it sit there and collect dust while the Americans are going to work every day saying, wow, they're busy working on my bike. They're putting a lot of effort. They hold it in inventory because short lead time would make people think, man, it didn't take much work to put that bike together. Or perhaps, have you ever gone to a nice, fancy five-star restaurant and you place your order for your starters, you know, soup and salad and entree, and they bring them all out at the same time? That's not McDonald's or Burger King. You're not in a hurry. You want to sit there and enjoy the ambiance, and it's like they're trying to rush you out of there. Uh, I've seen Apex chapters make the mistake of saying we have to have cheap prices on certification courses or dinner meetings. I've seen a lot of Apex chapters in the United States say dinner meeting this month, it's free. Those are always the lowest attended events. What's the perception of value there, right? So there are things that can be an order loser. You get better at, and the marketplace says, no, that, that didn't help me. Another one, uh, McDonald's should never, ever, ever try to make their burgers taste better. They should keep them tasting like crap. 
Because if they improve the taste, they will lose business because we are used to that. So in the United States, whether I drive into a McDonald's, whether it's Binghamton, whether it's Omaha, whether it's Boise, Idaho, I always expect that same crappy taste. If they improved it, I'd bite and i go, this doesn't taste like a Big Mac. Now, some people doubt me on this, but you're either old enough to remember, or you can look it up on Google, Coca-Cola tried to improve the taste of their soda in the 80s. They were the number one selling soft drink worldwide for 80 years, and they tried to change their taste. And people said, it doesn't taste like Coke to me. So my advice is identify all of these different things. You should agree internally. So this is more or less a homework assignment. It's not something we'll complete here. But it's something where I will say, you take the effort and agree on these at work. And you figure out what it is that's important. Make sure you spend your resources to hit the minimum level on the order qualifiers. Then invest every extra cent or extra rand, every ounce of sweat, Every iota of energy getting better and better at order winners because as you do that, you will gain market share. If you do not gain market share as you get better on an order winner, you didn't really identify the order winner. Extend this through the supply chain. If customers are buying for you from you because you got short lead time, your suppliers should have short lead time. Customers buying from you because you have high quality, don't be buying from cheap vendors because they got low cost. These should be consistent through your supply chain. We live in a world where it's not company A versus company B competition. It's company A's supply chain versus company B's supply chain. What am I at, seven minutes to go? Oh, plenty of time, nine minutes. Whew, I can relax. Any volunteer, if you are familiar with the concepts of vertical and horizontal supply chain integration. Oh, I said I was going to hand out a prize. What was, who missed out on the prize? Somebody answered a prize. What was that? What was the one that I promised to hand out a prize on? You don't remember? OK, I get to keep the prize. There's a prize if somebody can describe vertical and horizontal supply chain order, uh, integration. Please. Maybe in the petroleum industry where, um, you know, you, you own the, let's say you've got a, a refinery, an oil refinery, but you also own, let's say, the, 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 the gas stations. So you vertically integrate your supply chain. And that would be uh, vertical. That could include, yeah. Horizontal. Hmm. It'll basically be building on your... On your, on your gas station, so you, you set up more gas stations. Um, at a particular, expanding a particular node. You've got a quick cheat sheet here for the eight lean wastes. Uh, in terms of that word downtime, that's an acronym. Each of those letters stands for one of the uh, lean wastes. So vertical integration. You know, so since we love uh, Ford, the original Ford Automotive Company, they owned rubber tree farms and they made tires. They owned iron ore mines. They mined the iron ore, sandblasted it into pig iron, shipped that over to a steel foundry where it was forged into steel to build the bodies on the cars. That's vertical integration. I say soup to the lug nuts. And a good contrast is General Motors. Horizontal integration, they said, okay, we're lots and lots of car companies focusing on building the cars acquiring more business at that particular node in the supply chain. So integration can be both, uh, vertical integration can be forward or backward. Backward would be acquiring a supplier. So uh, did you know McDonald's is the world's most prolific potato farmer? <laughs> it's all those french fries. They said, man, we got to get in the potato farming business. That was backwards vertical integration. Forward integration, how about Apple stores? You know, Apple said, hey, we can have retail stores. So they make a product, but then have the stores. So that was downstream. In terms of horizontal integration uh, and acquisition, we could say when Fiat acquired Chrysler Motor Company. And in terms of a merger, I like using the example of Hewlett Packard and Compaq Computer Companies. Okay, that was an even merger. Um, between horizontal and vertical integration, which one do you think would be most consistent with outsourcing? 
What, what was this? Who said horizontal? Who said that first over here? Yeah, your focus, horizontal is consistent with focusing on your core competency. If it's not core competency, outsource it. Yes, sir. So, to follow on what you just said. Hold uh, well, one second. I want to make sure everyone hears you. Thanks. Thank you so much. So, following on what you've just said, McDonald's make the fries. They did not have a core competency in farming potatoes. So, why did they. They, do develop, they have developed a core competency in that. They are good at raising potatoes and making them into French fries. But it didn't exist at the time of backward integrating. At the t um, a long time ago, maybe they never even thought about it. You know, I mean, this is a, something that started with one restaurant in the Chicago area in the late 50s. So, I mean, there's usually some point in time where you start to then think about it, your business gets big enough. Yeah. When they were one uh, fast food restaurant in Chicago, wouldn't have been worth having a potato farm, right? So it's when they got so huge, they said, and recognizing, you know, the major portion that potatoes represent in terms of their buy because that's one of their major uh, products. So there's a point where you realize this. Um, and in fact, uh, Henry Ford, the Ford company, went from vertical to horizontal, right? They are no longer in the potato, or excuse me, <laughs> they're no longer in the rubber tree farm business or in the iron ore business because it just doesn't make sense. And this lends itself to the idea of what are the advantages versus limitations. With that total end-to-end -end vertically integrated supply chain, the advantages, you've got that wonderful thing called end-to-end -end visibility. Completely, right? You oughta, it's all your companies. You ought to know the status of every order and every product along the way, so it gives you much more control. The limitation, can you really have that focus? Can you be good at assembling automobiles, selling automobiles, raising rubber trees, and also mining iron ore? Maybe not. Contrast that with horizontal integration. We say, okay, focus on what we're good at and let other people do things that they're good at. Do we have the supply chain visibility? Maybe not. I said that I was gonna make sure you did work. I said you were gonna have fun. I hope I came through on both of those, but I also said I'm gonna make sure you're change agents. So again, I'm gonna ask you all to stand up, please. Stay auf, bitte. I'm gonna ask you to take what I say is the business person's Hippocratic Oath. Uh, we say doctors have a Hippocratic Oath, do no harm. This oath for the business persons is going to be one how you pledge to be agents of change. So please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I swear from this day forward to be a more unique and original individual. I will strive to live outside the box in all that I say and do. And above all else, I promise not to repeat what other people say. <laughs> we don't have a lot of time for uh, questions here. We're down to like two minutes and 13 seconds. Two minutes and nine seconds. Uh, Two minutes and seven seconds. Anybody have a question? Maybe one question, one comment, or you give me the answer. We'll do it Jeopardy style, and I'll come up with a question and give myself a piece of candy for that. I, of course, will be available after the session or whatever. I'll be hanging out outside. If you do have any other questions, as I said, there's a copy of my card up here. If you want to leave a copy of the card, I will make sure you get a copy of the slides. And remember, the answer key for all those exercises will be on the Wolva app.